everyone uh, to the github webinar uh, today the topic is attain the life of a developer on github and uh, this webinar is going to cover the different aspects of working with github every day as a developer uh, how to build features quicker using open source software planning your dev life cycle tracking issues uh, pull request working with actions and packages uh, also we'll cover securing your application with devsecops and other advanced security features this will be a presentation followed by a demo <laughs> to use the different features uh, effectively. <clears throat> and the speaker today is uh, Dhanashri Chavan. Uh, Dhanashri Chavan is a senior enterprise advocate at GitHub, and she closely works with the developer community to build awareness around GitHub products and features and advocates for customer needs internally. Uh, prior to GitHub, she spent over 14 years in the US and Malaysia in roles spanning engineering, professional services and sales. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over, <clears throat> hand it over to Dhanashri. And if you have any questions, please use the chat. Uh, I can see that all of you are already using the chat for um, telling us where you are from and what organization you are from. But if you have any questions, please keep them coming in the chat. And what we will do is uh, we'll keep uh, you know taking questions uh, either at a logical break or maybe towards the end of the presentation as we go on. So keep your questions coming in as as they as they occur to you. Yeah, with that, uh, I will hand it over to uh, Dhanashri to uh, present us uh, on this topic. Over to you, Dhanashri. Hey, thanks a lot, Vinay. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in the morning. I think it's the morning for most of you. So I'm based in Bangalore, India. Like Vinay said, I'm a senior developer advocate here at GitHub. Um, and we are really delighted to have you join here today. Uh, as a quick reminder, as part of the Microsoft for Startups cohort, you all are actually eligible for GitHub Enterprise benefits. So um, like when I said, my presentation is a, a lot demo heavy today because that's what we wanted to look at, you know, how a developer who's using GitHub would go through his day and his or her day. And we will end the presentation with a Q&A. In the meantime, we have really amazing colleagues here on the team chat window. So if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them at any time. With that, I'm actually going to go off camera as well because I'm getting some bandwidth issues here. OK, so let's jump right in. Today, what we are going to cover is um, planning and collaboration aspects. We'll cover deployment and uh, building aspects and also securing your software supply chain. OK. Now, let's just take a step back. And for those of you who've not heard of GitHub, who've never really used GitHub, I just want to give you a quick glimpse into who we are. So today we are the largest DevSecOps platform on the planet. We have over 83 million developers. Uh, the number is much higher, actually. Just to give you a context of how quickly we are growing, uh, about a year and a half ago when I joined GitHub, we were at 56 million. So you can see the amount of growth that we've had. And these developers are not just across these amazingly innovative companies that we all know and love, you know, the Slacks, the Ubers, the Netflix of the world. But also uh, we have developers from, from high schools. We have developers from government agencies. We have developers from startups such as yourselves. We have developers from the largest global enterprises around the world who use and trust GitHub. OK, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just to give you a brief of how we've really evolved. Right. So we started about 11 or 12 years ago as a source code um, collaboration platform. This is where our founders wanted developers to come and be able to collaborate on the software that they were working on. And very quickly, we had open source projects like <clears throat> sorry, Ruby, which came in. And they realize that that overhead of you know maintaining that website of actually storing and maintaining code securely didn't have to be done by them. So that's how they hosted their code on GitHub. And another side benefit was thousands of developers, uh, you know, open source uh, working on open source projects actually then got attracted to GitHub. As Ruby grew, the network effects really grew, and that's how we are today. Today, I'm very proud to say almost 90% of all open source projects and libraries, some of the most popular ones you can see here, you know, Apache, MongoDB, TensorFlow, all of these, these have actually born and, and they live on GitHub. OK, so today what we want to talk about is how a developer who logs into GitHub would actually use GitHub and all of the GitHub features. 
So as I said, we started off as a source code collaboration, you know, source code hosting platform. But very quickly over the past three and a half years, we've added features to actually encompass all of the entire software development lifecycle. Now to help me with the demo today, I'm going to take some personas here. OK, now consider that I work for an organization. The organization is called Octodemo and there's this project we are working on. It's the online bookstore. Pretty simple. Now we have two other personas here who are going to help me. There's Samantha, who is my project lead, and Arjun, who is my peer reviewer or team lead. And together, let's see how we are using GitHub to collaborate on any upcoming features that we want to add on this online bookstore. So for the first part, let's go over to the plan track and collaborate features. Let me just stop sharing. And now actually I'm going to share my entire screen. So I can toggle between the windows. Um, when I can you see my browser now? Uh, yes, Nancy, I can see your browser. OK, great. Thank you. So when a developer actually or, you know, a person with a GitHub account actually logs in to their GitHub account and navigates over to their code repository, this is how the main page of their repository would typically look like. OK, now a lot of you I'm sure here are developers and have used GitHub in the past, so this UI might look familiar. For those of us who haven't, let's spend a couple of minutes to look at a few things here. OK, uh, like I was mentioning, GitHub started off as a source code management platform, so you can definitely host all of your code in the repositories here. Now, if your code is actually currently on a legacy system like say Subversion or Mercurial or say another Git server even, Moving your project to leverage GitHub capabilities is also quite easy. Now remember that these repositories that we've defined can also be created using a predefined template, which can then be reused across your organization here. So this is the main page of my repository. This is a simple Maven project. This is a Java application for an online bookstore. Now we'll see here. If you can see the languages section, the environment section, etc., that GitHub is already surfacing a lot of information here. So here you can see all of the languages that are being used within this Java application and within this project. Now, a side benefit that some clients come to us and say is this really helps when they want to skill, uh, you know, people in their team, uh, upskill people in their team, or even they want to recruit new people. Now, most readmes on GitHub, uh, most uh, sorry, most code repositories on GitHub would have something like a readme.md. So this is simply a place that tells you what is this repository about, right? So if someone is joining your team or your organization, they can understand what this code is doing. Now, as you can see here, I was mentioning this is a online bookstore application. This is something like it. Uh, it something that would show up if I actually clicked on the deployment here. Now this repository that I have is under this organization, which is called the Octodemo organization. Now think of an organization as um, you know, a place where you would say define it, that could correspond to maybe your company or um, say your business unit or your team. So think of this as a security parameter where you can then store all your repositories. Um, you can invite a lot of people to your organization. You can uh, group them into teams and then basically have role based access control on your repositories and all of the code that is being stored within your organization. OK, now as a startup, we frequently wear multiple hats, right? Uh, we are a lean team. So although here I did get my persona, Samantha, who's my project lead, chances are that as a developer, even you will be tracking what's happening within your project. Right. So GitHub provides you a way of doing that right beside your code. So if I looked at this project's feature here that GitHub has, we can define a bunch of projects, which is very similar to any project management tool like you've used maybe Jira, right, for tracking all your work. So if I look at, say, this project board that I have here, and say Samantha was looking at the on upcoming sprint that we have, sprint two. Now there are a few things that you can do with project boards. You can track your issues. You can track your pull requests. Now you can even create custom notes. OK, so I was if I wanted to say, say upcoming feature 01. 
I can as easily add it here. And the cool thing is I can even convert this into an issue and choose which repository this should con uh, this should correspond to. The other cool thing is if you can see my cards here that I can actually drag and drop across these columns, which is like a basic Kanban board, uh, you know, to do in progress done. So all of these cards, uh, they don't have to be from the same repository. So as a project manager, this is extremely then simple to track your work across multiple repositories, across multiple uh, teams, for instance. OK, now another thing you can do here is look at the project tracking charts. OK, I can of course configure mine, but I, I'll just show you quickly this burn up chart that I have, which GitHub has automatically populated for me. So this is very useful when I'm trying to identify bottlenecks uh, and issues blocking the team from making progress. So that's what the burn up charts are. I can also have custom charts. Like I said, I can define it by the custom range. I can configure the X and Y axis. I can configure what I want to see this by. I can even configure what I want to group this chart by. OK, so just from a project management perspective, projects and project insights are extremely useful. So going back to this uh, project board that we have right now, Samantha now decides to get this book search feature. And she can go inside the feature. She can click on the link very quick, quickly look at what needs to be done and add me as a a developer who needs to work on this particular issue. OK, so. This is where typically Samantha's work as a project lead would end where she can now plan and track her work for the day. Now, if I go back now, this is me who is logged in into my organization and my repository. If I go back into the issues and I look at this book search feature. I'll see that I've been assigned this. So at the start of my day, I can come and look at the issues that have been assigned. Now, one important reason that we are using issues for collaboration is that it gives you this amazing way of being able to collaborate right next to where your code lives. OK, you can use the at the rate function. You can use it to call out, call out, say, a person in the team or a person or even an entire team. If you wanted their inputs about something, you can even use Markdown to have flowcharts right within this issue. OK, now over here. If I had a question, as I was saying, I work for Octodemo organization. Now, if I had a question about this book search feature that was assigned to me, GitHub now provides us a way of uh, an additional place, if you will, of where I can collaborate with my team. This is called this GitHub discussions. So think of uh, you know discussions as a place where you talk or you collaborate and issues as a place where you do. OK, so over here you'll see that I have a bunch of different categories that I can start. I can create a new discussion and um, start say a Q&A with my community or or the people in my team to ask, hey, I have a book search feature coming up. What do you think about this? Say more details here. OK, and I can start this discussion. So we are seeing a lot of uh, companies actually use this extremely well. Uh, NASA uses discussions to talk through their uh, mission control technologies. We have uh, teams like React. For instance, who are using um, GitHub discussions to talk about all their upcoming features. Uh, so if I can go back here to the React board. And when they actually launched React 18, this is a way for the community to actually reach the maintainers really quickly. And I think that's a fantastic way of innovating, especially when you're working for a startup, correct? So moving on from discussions. As a developer, when I am assigned this particular issue and I have now have a place to collaborate with my team and I'm clear on what needs to be done. Typically, what I would do is create a different branch, right? So this branching concept actually helps you to create a sandbox environment where you, you can create all of your say, um, you know, do all of your experiments without fear of failure or fear of basically affecting other people in your team. And that is extremely important. 
So one thing as a developer that I could do when I start working on a piece of code is, of course, I could check out that repository locally, right? Yeah. Or what I can do is use a GitHub feature called code spaces. OK, so. The traditional way of doing it would be cloning this repository, setting up the required dependencies. This might take me at least an hour. Now, if I try to create a code, a code space instead, right? Um, I can use the defaults that my organization is uh, providing me here, which is a four core machine with a eight gig of RAM, or I can go ahead and actually configure and create this code space. OK, mm -hmm. I can define what branch this corresponds to. I can define which region this code space should come up. And most importantly, I can define now the machine type that I need. Now there are a few advantages of doing this. OK, so a quick summary is basically code space. Think of it just as an instant cloud developer environment where you can now run, test, debug or even push everything that you're used to doing locally on a local development environment setup and instead do it in the cloud. Now the advantages like I was saying is if I use this dev container.json and actually share it across my team, any new person who's joining the team does not have to configure all of their settings again. OK, so it's very easy for them to now I won't create this code space here, but instead I'll pull up this code space that I already had open. And let's look at what it looks like, right? So with the dev container.json, there are a multiple, uh, there are multiple things that I can actually configure. I can configure what ports this application should forward to. I can configure what extensions need to be installed. So when you think of anyone who's joining your team, so it's me or Samantha or Arjun, right? We are not now spending time on actually setting up our development environment, but we can actually start coding really quickly. The second advantage I talked to you about was the elastic workspaces that we are providing, correct? So with the size of the machines that I want to use for every test case, for instance, or every client requirement, once that piece of work is done, my hardware or laptop is not sitting around just unused. OK, now that's a very, very useful feature because you can now deploy and experiment without having to wait for procurement, without having to worry about the size of the machines that you're spinning up. You can spin your code spaces up and down really quickly. So like I was saying, I'm a developer. For those of you who are joining, hi and welcome to this session. What we are talking about is how a developer would use GitHub to plan, track and collaborate. So we looked at a bunch of uh, project tracking features and now we are actually in the uh, dev container in the cloud which is code spaces okay so a good practice in software development as you all are aware is you should typically host your code along with your configuration right so if you can see here the docker container.yaml is here i have the dev container.json here as well so this actually dictates how my visual studio environment should behave and not just mine how it should behave for everyone else in my team if i was to share this dev container.json in fact this code spaces gives me a complete runtime with the ability to add additional containers. So you can actually host this in a container within a container model. OK, we've seen customers who've actually come back to us and said that they have been able to streamline developer onboarding to 15 seconds down from the one or two weeks that it used to take them prior to adopting Git, uh, GitHub code spaces. OK, so you guys, you can imagine as a startup how useful this feature can be. Now for the uh, change that I want to do, which is the book search feature. In the interest of time, I actually had gone ahead and opened my code base and actually made these changes. All I need to do now is enter this commit message here. So book search feature. Say 03, commit it here. I don't have stage commits. And I publish this branch back up to GitHub because all of these changes were done, done locally. Another cool thing here is actually if I start my debugging within GitHub, I can actually open up a browser which shows what my changes would look locally even before they are published up to GitHub. OK, now I'm going to leave this dev container for a second and go back to my code repo here. So you see that the commit message that I had 
uh, it is actually created a new feature branch, which is good coding practice again, not uh, making changes directly to main. And what I can do here is go ahead and open a pull request. Now, if you can see, these are the two branches that are being compared. And think of pull requests as a flag, right? That you're waving to your team saying, hey, I as a developer, I'm done with all the changes that I have to do. Now I want you to comment on it for you to review it. So this really is a comparison between these two branches. And this is very, very important because this helps to ensure that only quality reviewed code is getting merged back into your code code repository, into your main branch. OK, and pull requests actually originated at GitHub and today they are the de facto standard across software um, coding as well. Now, one thing you can do here is create a draft pull request instead of pull request. So imagine that I've made these changes locally, but I don't want uh, you know to waste someone else's time. I want to see all of the tests that are running uh, prior to advertising to my team that my code changes are ready. So I can actually create a draft pull request here. OK, and this is again a very important feature that we are providing to developers so they can again experiment freely. So for now, right now I'm just going to create a pull request here. And as a developer, when I came in today to my code base, to my repository, I looked at the issues that were assigned to me. You know, I looked at this book search feature that was assigned um, as to me as an assignee. I went ahead, made my changes instead of doing it locally. I went ahead and did it on my code spaces. And now I have opened a pull request for people to to tell them that, hey, I have now made changes to this file. Can you please go ahead and look at the changes? And right now, for now, my work as a developer here is done. OK, so let me switch back to my slides real quick. So we were looking at the plan, track and collaboration features here. So we looked at projects, we looked at project insights. So basically we were looking at the uh, burn up charts, right? So there are no bottlenecks which are hindering your team. We were looking at issues, discussions, and we even started um, actually building the code with code spaces and then we issued a pull request. Um, when I, you can see my my demo here, I mean the presentation here, right? Uh, yes, uh, I can see it and also uh, you, uh, let us know we are getting some questions. Um, okay. So we have been answering those questions in the chat. Whenever you're oh. ready to answer those live, let, let us know. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Ambili should be here as well. So I think yeah, she'll yeah. be able to help. Okay, yeah, awesome. yeah, answering the questions in the chat, but yeah, cool. yeah we can also answer okay. them live. Sounds good. Sounds good. So I think I'll complete a few things before we get into live questions because we have quite a few things to cover. OK, so for now, let's go back to our demo now and look at how we can now automate our development lifecycle. OK, so one thing you will notice is as soon as uh, my pull request was opened, I have these bunch of tests that were actually kicked off by GitHub. Now this happens because of automation features that GitHub provides. OK, and this automation that we provide is called GitHub Actions. So if I move now from my pull request tab into my actions tab, you can see I already have a bunch of workflows that I have defined. OK, if I just look at this build, test, publish workflow, for instance, and I look at this book search feature 03 that I just uh, was able to commit using code spaces. You will see how uh, visual this is, you know, for a developer to come in and see what are all the steps that we're taking. So even a developer or an administrator can easily monitor your workflow runs visually and see what commits it's actually uh, referring to. OK, now if I actually drill down into each of these, you'll see that we have these rich set of logs that come up. OK, and interestingly, if you have some secrets defined, these logs actually automatically redact them as well. Now if I go back over here to my visual flow, you'll see that let me just increase the size here. OK, so over here you'll see that this step which I was I had defined in my workflow or workflow automation actually has two steps. 
Okay, one which is building Java on one version of Ubuntu and one which is building it on another version. So this is Ubuntu 20.04 and this is on Ubuntu 20 22.04. OK, now what Mat Matrix Builds does is it provides a very, very interesting and powerful feature to our developers, because basically not only can you have these um, different actions running on different um, say versions or different platforms, but you can even quickly see what what is the logs that you have been able to get with it okay now let's see where are all of these workflows actually defined as a developer that is very very important for you right so this is my organization octodemo this is my repository dana online bookstore if i now navigate over to the code feature you'll see that all of these actions we are defining is within this special folder which is the dot github folder and the workflows folder within it all of these uh, actions are actually defined as YAML files. So YAML is, as most of you I'm sure know, yet another markup language. OK, mm -hmm. and one of the key benefits that we've seen with actions is because it is, you know, just uh, yet another markup language or the workflow files are defined as YAML files. It's very easy for developers to actually start coding right away. So unlike, say, a tool out there like Jenkins, your team does not have to ramp up on any specialized skills over here. OK, now what is the most important piece of any automation? Uh, I think you guys are muted, so I'm going to go ahead and say this. Any, you know, the most important piece is, of course, the trigger, right? What will actually trigger this workflow? So this is what the on keyword here for this automation is going to do. You'll see that this on keyword right now it's defined as push. So whenever um, uh, it, a push is made to any branch in the workflows repository, this workflow will get triggered. The beauty of GitHub is that we have over 50 plus events that we've defined as triggers. So these are not just your you know, uh, usual CI CD triggers. Um, I actually have a tab here that will show you all of these triggers that are available within GitHub and that can actually create uh, uh, which can actually sorry trigger this workflow, right? So it can be a label change. It can be issues. It can be pushed. It can be a pull request uh, and a lot of other things you can do. You can even trigger these workflows manually as well. OK, so going back here. Once you define how or why, when this automation will actually kick off, you then need to define what will happen, right? And that's what these jobs, uh, the job section is going to define for us. So one thing it's going to define is where this will actually run, what machines and the steps that will actually be taken. OK, so if you look here at the steps, I have an interesting um, file name here or interesting call out here, which is called a checkout action. OK, so what this actions is, is basically um, one of the first things you would typically do when you are you know, creating your own actions uh, is you would check out the latest version of your code onto your runner. So anytime you spin up an action, it's actually going to spin up a brand new container. And this is a great segue to now talk about reusable components. So let's actually head over to reusable components and look at GitHub Marketplace. Now, GitHub Marketplace, think about this as a place, um, you know, I'm sure you're used to a Play Store or an App Store. So think about this as that marketplace, as that App Store for all things GitHub. So today, if you are integrating with, uh, say, third parties like Jira, Atlassian, you know, CircleCI, et cetera, you can have these apps which can integrate with these third party systems. Or what you can have is if you are trying to have these transient jobs, especially for your CI CD pipelines, you can use actions. The amazing thing is we have over 14,000 actions defined today, and these are actually uh, published by three different kinds um, of folks, OK? One is, of course, GitHub ourselves that we we uh, publish our own action. So for instance, that checkout action that we were looking at, this is something that GitHub has actually published. So 
along with you know maybe using the latest version one thing you can do is quickly see how to use it within your workflow mm -hmm. file you can see different scenarios you can fetch the history yeah, and there is a ton of documentation which is very typical for github where we are providing really user friendly documentation on how you can use something like this right another uh, you know um, the actions the second kind of actions that are published here are actually by trusted uh, partners and oems so think of red hat openshift um, think of datadog or docker or service now all of these folks have actually published actions right here within uh, the github marketplace and i really don't know of another uh, you know ci cd provider tool out there which has such a rich um reusable component which the first party integrations and you know the companies themselves are actually providing now the third kinds of actions are actually from the open source community and we spoke about this with 83 million plus developers actually using the platform we have a lot of uh, reusable lego pieces if you will that you can actually start using within your ci cd pl uh, platform so workflows so, so instead of building something from scratch you can actually drop something within an action into your workflow file and start um, you know go to, go to market really really fast today i'm very very proud to say that actions is the number one ci cd uh, ci provider on github uh, just to give you again an idea uh, about a year and a half ago we had about 6000 actions Today we are at 14,000 plus actions, and this is not just you know of course because of the vast DevSecOps platform that we have, but also because of the ease of use of using these um, actions. Today GitHub Actions is the only CI/CD tool out there that is really helping developers in the way that they are used to working, right within right within their code repositories, right within their code workflow. And uh, this is just a high level overview of actions. Of course, there's a lot of deep down that we can do. There's a concept of self hosted runners um, that we can also touch on. So um, I would definitely encourage all of you to go ahead and and look at that as well. OK. So let's go back to automating and look at the GitHub Actions, uh, the demo recap here. We looked at GitHub Actions. We were able to look at the reusable workflows. So as uh, developers, you can get started quickly. You can uh, look at the actions on the workflow, uh, the GitHub Marketplace. You can look at the visual representation of the workflow. You can look at matrix builds. And there's one thing I want to touch on here, which I did miss. When we were looking at the project tracking features, right? Uh, this is of course sparsely populated, but I wanted to actually show you how GitHub is actually publishing our public roadmap on using GitHub projects. Okay, the very cool thing is you can filter by some feature that you're trying to look at or for um, say go to cloud. And there's a very simple way of doing project management and project tracking as well. Okay, so going back now to our presentation, Let's see the next part that we want to cover. Policies and controls. As a developer, as an organization, as a startup, this is extremely important to you, right? So let's go back. Um, and in the interest of time, maybe I'll just touch on a few things really quickly here. I'm going to go back to my handy pull request, which I had opened. <laughs> so over here, you'll see that there is a, a reviewer section here, OK? And we'll see here that at least one approving reviewer is required. So in GitHub, we use a setting known as code owners file. So which is also defined within the dot GitHub workflow over here in code owners. Again, I won't go to that, but maybe I can leave you with a link here where you can actually go and see how you can define that for which files you want which uh, person or which team to be a reviewer so that you can define your controls and right at the action level itself. OK, another thing we wanted to look at is. When we go back to this pull request, um, let's look at one that I had actually closed earlier, OK, which was a star rating feature. So you will see that in addition to all of the files that were changed, which I can see as a reviewer. OK, 
I can now look at all the checks that were passed as well as well. And these checks bring me back to the action tab here. OK, so. If you look at this pull request that I was looking at. Oh, sorry, this is a code scanning uh, one that got kicked off. Let me look at the build test publish one here. You can see that one thing that we want to do is you want to make sure that these actions or the build parameters are actually running on a specific branch. OK, so if I go over to my settings here. And. Look at the branches that I have within the code and automation feature right now I have one. I can actually edit the branch protection rule for my main branch. So as I was mentioning, one of the basic tenets of Git is branching where you can create your sandbox environments. You can experiment without fear. So what we actually do is define policies at each of this branch level. So you want to make sure that you have reviewers who can actually review a particular change uh, before that pull request can be merged. OK, you can define what status checks are required before this pull request again can be merged and then number of different policies and controls that we can actually support here. OK, so this is also a way of branch protection in GitHub. Now let's go over here since we are in the settings tab and look at the environment section real quickly. Over here, think of environments as you know your uh, deployable targets. You could think of say production, which is our golden template, which should not be really uh, you know messed with, or staging or UAT. So anytime I want to deploy changes to this environment, actually I can drill down into each of this environment and define how I want that environment to behave. So I can add up to six reviewers who need to review any changes to this environment. And this is an environment protection rule, which is slightly different than the branch protection rule. If I wanted to stagger my deployment for some reason, I can use a wait timer. This is in minutes, so that's one thing I can do. Another important feature I can do here is actually define environment secrets. So not only can you define these secrets, which are then going to be used by your workflows or your automation within your environments, you can actually define them at your organization level. You can even define them at your repo level. OK, so these are just different kinds of policies and controls that we are trying to provide to you. So going back here. So we looked at environments, we looked at secrets, we looked at branch protection rules. The next thing we want to look at as a developer is packages and release releases here. OK, so one thing you want to do is once you're done with the CI portion, right? Say your actions have all run. I have made the changes as as a developer. I have made all the changes. To my code and the the automation has kicked off. You look at all the add book title change. OK, all of this automation has kicked off. And if I wanted to make this change, one thing I can do is. If I look at actions here and let's look at a handy build test publish workflow. OK. Now you will notice. That for one of these workflow runs of build test publish. And one of these changes that took place, for instance. When I actually went ahead to this container build and publish container step that I had within the workflow, if I go down here, you will see that what GitHub is trying to do is actually sign into the GitHub container registry. OK, so what we're trying to do is instead of having a separate package management tool to track your binaries in a separate place, what GitHub allows you to do is go ahead and uh, go ahead and actually define this in one single place. So if I now click on this packages that you have, you will see all of these different um, you know, packages that we are supporting, different tools that we are supporting. So it can be for containers, uh, for Ruby, for Maven, for um, you know, Maven for say Java or NuGet for .NET. So everything that you're building can be hosted right in one place. 
Now, the advantage is that, you know, of course, since your code and packages together, when you're doing builds and say there are a lot of dependencies, you can now actually apply your policies a lot quicker. So if I actually go ahead and click on this online bookstore application that I had deployed, you'll see quickly all of these stats. When was it last published? You know, what are the discussions that are being had around it? The total number of developers, the total number of collaborators. So again, a single place where you can track your deployments as well. Now, once you build your packages, you need to deploy it. One good thing with um, with GitHub is, you know, with all of the automation features that we are really providing, one feature that we do provide is something called issue ops. So you can actually have a labeled deployment trigger. OK, and now if I go ahead and these code changes, for instance, now some of these have. Um, let's see, they all seem to have failed except one which I'll come to. But if all of my code changes had now passed, what I could do is before I actually deployed anything to production, I could actually change this and with a, a label, say deploy to QA. I can have this automation run. OK, so you'll see there is another step that actually gets defined here, a label deployment trigger. And with this, what I can do is all of these code changes that you're seeing here, I can now uh, deploy them to a staging and a QA environment before I even want to go ahead and deploy it to production. So this is extremely um, powerful when you think about automation, right? It's just making the life of your developers that much easier. One last piece I do want to show you here with um, GitHub Actions is definitely this deploy environment. So let's look at this. One of these workflows that uh, went ahead and was successful. Now, if I scroll down to this deploy to environment, um, we will see here, as you can see, if you can see these logs, what we are doing is we are trying to log into Azure, but we are actually using something called OIDC. And I can quickly click on this link and look at more definitions here and more, uh, you know, uh, the scenarios of how I can use OIDC. Now, think of OIDC as, you know, instead of using your credentials in a file, in a flat file or a vault someplace, you can actually use OIDC to establish trust between GitHub and your cloud provider. Now, this cloud provider can be, um, you know, AWS, GCP, Azure, or even HashiCorp. Now, once this trust is established, there are a set of privileges that you can potentially use without storing your credentials as part of a script. So I think I have this open here as well. Again, this is a link that I will drop into the uh, the chat, but this is something that is very powerful. And uh, you know how we are evolving really the security features and giving this into the hands of the developer so that they're not really using, you know, the standard traditional archaic ways of storing their credentials um, in a flat file, God forbid, but actually using uh, features like OIDC, which then um, negates the need of having something like that. OK, so we spoke about code owners, project actions here um, and deployments. So let's talk about deployments, which is the last feature here around our CI CD workflow. And if I clicked on the view deployments here, what I'm trying to look at is all of this code repository that I had built, right? And which was now being hosted across these two environments. And there were some changes that I had deployed um, to my staging and to my QA environment. It should show up what that bookstore would look like. Okay. So here we go. So we have this bookstore which I had and uh, previously before I began the demo, I had actually been able to um, get this star rating feature here. So over here you can see all the versions of it. You can see where it's running. So again, a very, very powerful and useful way of seeing everything uh, within your um, code, your deployment, your packages, your releases all within a single place. OK, a uh, quick time check here. I think we are at um, OK, we have 15 minutes, so I'm going to go now to the last portion of my demo here. OK, uh, Vinayak, I think you guys have all the questions covered, right? So I'm going to quickly move on to the security feature if that's OK. 
Uh, yeah, Dennis, we have been uh, answering the um, um, the questions in the uh, in the chat. OK, so people are understanding. So if we have some time at the end, we probably might take a couple of questions. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. OK, I'm really glad to see the questions coming. Folks, please keep the questions coming now. Uh, we're going to shift to um, the last part of this demo. OK, now, as you remember, this demo was titled you know, day in the life of a developer. So why are we really talking about the security features here? OK, and this is very, very key because we keep talking about shifting security left. OK, and if you haven't heard this term before or if you don't know what it means, it's basically instead of securing your code after the fact, you know, after this change has actually gone into staging and then your security team comes and audits each part of your workflow. What we want to do is save time and money by empowering your developers to actually fix and secure the code as they were writing it. OK, and this is, you know, of course, it's almost 100 X more beneficial, but there's a second benefit to this. The second benefit is today in the industry, we are seeing that there are there's a real dearth of security experts, security researchers within any organization. So typically a ratio is really, really skewed. Um, a ratio of say a developer to security researchers would be anywhere from 100 is to 1, which means that the amount of code that is being churned out every day, especially since we are all becoming digital companies, you know, it is really not um, easy for all the security teams to now stay in tandem with all of the code that is being generated. So it's very important that as developers, we try to secure and fix all the vulnerabilities that we are seeing within our code as we are writing it. OK, so with that, let's move over to the demo section of this. Now, one of the things as a, a developer, OK, I don't even have to be a security person. I can do really quickly is within my repository, go into the insights tab of my repository and let's scroll over the dependency graph. Of course, uh, security is a huge topic, but for you know, I'm going to cover some of the things that as a developer would be most relevant to you. Now, what dependency insights really does is <clears throat> sorry, as soon as you drop any code repo into GitHub, this dependency graph will start showing you a um, summary. So of your manifest and your log files stored in the repository. So here you can track all your direct dependencies and your indirect dependencies. So if there was a dependency for any of these dependencies that I was using, it would show up here. OK, so this really is how GitHub provides you a descriptive analytics of your security vulnerabilities. Now, another thing I can do as a developer again is if I moved over to the security tab and I looked at all of these alerts that I'm seeing, let's look at the depend about alert. OK, I have one depend about alert here. I can log in. And even as a developer, OK, now I don't have to be a security expert. The beauty of this is GitHub is giving you uh, all these uh, you know, outdated uh, dependencies. And if it finds a vulnerability in a package, it's giving you a link to the affected file in the project. It's giving you information about all of this, uh, you know, the fixed versions, of course, which is here, but it's also giving you industry relevant data like CVEs, which is, you know, your common vulnerabilities and exposures, or your CWEs, which is your common weakness and immigration. So from descriptive analytics in the insights tab, we can actually provide you prescriptive analytics so that now if you if your developer comes in and sees, you know, this is how a vulnerable code looks like. This is how it's actually going to impact you. What are the patches that are available and what are the workarounds and additional reading information? Look, this is going to empower our developers now so they are not repeating these same mistakes twice. OK. Now, one step further to this is if I went over ahead again to my pull request, you will see that this pull request was actually opened by Dependabot. So if Dependabot knows the fix, it's going to open a pull request to update your dependency manifest with the closest non-vulnerable version. So what I mean by this is this. If I went over to the files change section, you will see that the version here is 4.13. And GitHub uh, Dependabot has now 
uh, uh, found that 4.13.1 does not have a vulnerability, it's going to now recommend that you upgrade your file from 4.13 to the 4.13.1 version. Okay, so not only are we providing you descriptive and prescriptive, uh, uh, you know, descriptions of how to fix your errors. This is also very, very powerful in saving a lot of man hours that might be needed in order to keep a track of your open source dependencies. And why is this important? Because as you're all aware, today um, modern software has almost 80 to 90 percent of components that come from open source. OK, so Dependbot is really helping us cover those sections of that. OK, now going over to the code scanning section here. Code scanning is, you know, our way of providing SAS um, to to uh, developers to uh, what you can do is here you can look at code QL and code analysis. What code scanning tool that GitHub offers is called code QL, which is the code query language. This is our semantic code analysis engine. So code QL lets you query code as though it were data. So it's going to help you automate some checks. You can also integrate any other third party scanning tools that you're using. For instance, if I wanted to do a say container scan, right? Um, sorry about the typo. So if I had to do a container scan, I can quickly configure this anchor container uh, scanning here within my um, code scanning workflow. So all of the results that are shown are within one single pane of glass, which is in addition to this code, uh, the code QL tool that we provide. Now you can filter your code scanning uh, results further. You can define them by the branch. Now this is again another important feature that we want to provide because for instance, if you had something that were, you were working on internally, right? Um, again, a, say a book search feature or a book title feature, you don't want to overwhelm your developers with false positive or a lot of noise uh, to signal ratio. And that's what you can reduce by using something like code QL. Um, another thing we can do here is look at secret scanning uh, alerts. OK, so secret scanning alerts is extremely important because what secret scanning does is it, all of these. Um, we have almost 70 plus token providing uh, partners that we have uh, defined patterns for. So we are looking at your code and scanning for any tokens that might have been introduced to your code base either accidentally or maliciously. OK, so once you enable secret scanning, we'll find all of your secrets at the repo level. Now, the best thing is that we look through your entire GitHub history of that repo. So it's not just at the top level, say if the secret was committed on say day one, but we'll actually find all your secrets through all the repos through all of your Git history that matches one of our patterns. And this is really very important. Um, I think I covered a lot of things here. <laughs> So the demo recap for now is, of course, we looked at Dependabot and the graph and insights, and we looked at some of the GitHub advanced security features, which is an additional level of uh, billing above our GitHub enterprise features. So again, GitHub enterprise you all are eligible for, but GitHub advanced security would be a layer uh, above that. OK, so to summarize, what we are trying to do is really provide you GitHub capabilities that will really help you foster this culture of inner sourcing of getting the best practices in open source projects within your startups, within your organizations. And it has three main benefits that we've seen. We can accelerate your software development, right? We've seen actions. So you can look at something as config as code. Uh, you can use automation. You can have pipelines that are stored in the same repo and are platform native to where your developers are doing the work. You can secure your software, you know, with GitHub advanced security, code scanning. So you are actually putting all of these security gates into the pull request workflow itself. And of course, you can improve organizational efficiency. We looked at GitHub Marketplace. This allows developers to leverage automation so you can actually leverage the entire community instead of building things from scratch. So this was all I had today. Thank you very much. Um, and I think. Uh, when I come, I'm going to go over and stop sharing and now look at the chat window here. Okay. Cool. 
Um, I think we are almost at time um, and I think we have been answering the questions in the chat. Uh, so, uh, you know, in the interest of time, we won't be, uh, you know, taking any questions. Any any last thought, Dhanasri? And also, uh, you know, before we go there, uh, I have just posted a link to the feedback session. Uh, so as I think some of you said, yes, this is uh, this. We have covered a lot of ground in uh, in a short webinar. And the reason is this is an overview webinar. And uh, what we have been doing is we have been regularly actually doing focus webinars on uh, GitHub actions, GitHub uh, code spaces, uh, GitHub advanced security. Um, and so on. Um, so you uh, you know keep a uh, keep an eye out for the mailers that are coming through MFS, uh, Microsoft for startups. As we will cover this uh, advanced topic, as we go deeper into each of these specific uh, areas. Uh, so then, if you have any questions on these operationally, you can actually uh, you know attend this, and uh, you know we should be able to answer many of the questions as we go deeper into each of these. Yeah, so yeah, please, uh, 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 we will also be sharing the recording. So uh, if if you can fill in the webinar, uh, uh, fill in the form, uh, we will help. It will help us improve. And if you have any other topics that we did not cover here and you want us to cover in future webinars, uh, as I said, like which are more focus sessions, do let us know because we'll use that to build our calendar. So we do this uh, GitHub webinar once a month, uh, you know, as we go on. So. Uh, so we should we will cover those topics definitely. Dhanushree, and you want to add anything? No, I think uh, you know, folks. Again, sorry we couldn't take live questions, but we had a lot to go through. I understand that. Uh, very happy to answer any questions. Please feel free to email us at startups at github.com if you have any questions. Again, a lot of these features are free for you to use as part of Microsoft for Startups cohort. So please make use of those features. Uh, very glad that you all were able to join us. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'll I'll just stop the recording and uh, we can all drop off. But before you do, uh, just a, a reminder again for the webinar uh, form, uh, feedback form, please do fill it and let us know. Thank you very much and uh, see you at the next webinar.